I hope you'll tolerate a little bit of foolishness to begin with. But what would it be like and what would the effect be for us as a community and as a Catholic Church if we were to gather and only on some, maybe even only on some occasional Sundays, celebrate Mass, celebrate the Eucharist? That prospect at times might seem almost appealing because the discipline of the Mass each week with its clearly set rituals and requirements set for us can be tough on many people and many people absent themselves. Maybe we'd turn up on one of these Sundays and there would be no need for a priest. Um, a member of the community would have been selected and they'd lead us. And I don't know what they'd do. Maybe they'd ask us to stand uh, with our hands in the air for ten minutes, praising God in a big loud voice. It wouldn't be a bad thing to do. Maybe um, somebody, some other leader would put us into groups and ask us to share for 15 minutes on a piece of scripture. Or maybe somebody would be inspired like a, with a gospel like today and we'd take all the benches out and when we came in, we'd be put into groups of 50 and asked to share breakfast together. That wouldn't be a bad thing. I pose these imaginary scenarios in the hope that we can come to appreciate even more fully what we do each Sunday in celebrating the Eucharist. The feast of the body and blood of Christ is an opportunity then for us to affirm the ongoing availability of the Eucharist as our central ritual as a church because it links us directly to Jesus. Some aspects of our culture and of our formation as Christians block us from this appreciation. And I'm going to suggest three, but I'm quite sure you can think of others. The first cultural blockage or mindset is, I think, as a result of television, the computer, and our electronic devices. They provide us with immediate entertainment, um, diversion, stimulation. And I think then, coming to an assembly, we might presume we are going to come and be entertained. Some people come, I think, expecting others to sing, that the homily will include a few jokes. And by the way, I'm not Pat Tonry and that it's okay to slip in a bit late and leave a bit early and, you know, somebody else will carry it. But, of course, the word liturgy has its root in the word work. Liturgy is liturgain, the work of the people. And this gave rise in later reflections in Latin to the word that the liturgy was the opus dei, the work of God. And so, yes... The Eucharist, the Mass, is work. It's the work of praising, listening, reflecting, asking, remembering, consuming, and being sent. Another block to appreciate the central role of the Eucharist, I think, is that sometimes it is considered simply as a historical reenactment something in the past, may be influenced by our approaches currently in the, in the church to the scriptures, that we want to know the historical realities of the texts. The Eucharist is not only, however, about a past sacrifice that is being recalled, but it is about one being made present. The once-for-all sacrifice of Christ and his Resurrection is made present in the assembly. And the sort of remembering at Mass that we do is a bit like, are connected in some ways, it's the type of remembering we are doing this weekend. 
we remember the sacrifice of those who died for the United States and for liberty and peace around the world, aware that what we are remembering is the current impact, not only the people, but the current good that their actions brought about. It's a living memory. And the Mass allows the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus to be present now and offers us also a foretaste of the Messianic banquet in the future. It brings us and opens us to future hope. The last sentence in the second reading today. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. We are moving into the future with hope as a result of the Eucharist. So the Eucharist does look backwards. It looks forwards and it combines both the past and the future in the present communion we have with Jesus. The third blockage in our culture might be summed up in the phrase, I am going to church. I am going to church. Now, don't get me wrong, going to church is important, but we need to open that phrase up a little bit more. We, as Catholics, are not simply going to church. We're not simply coming to listen to the scriptures, not simply to be inspired. We come to be united to Jesus in the manner in which he asked us to be united with him. The words of Jesus, do this in memory of me. We are going to gather with others to do what Jesus asked us to do, to be united with him in memory of him, breaking the bread and drinking the cup in memory of him. So these three blockages and the others that you can think sometimes obstruct our appreciation. But we know, and we need to articulate more fully, that we gather to do what Jesus did, to take, bless, break, and eat the bread in memory and in thanksgiving for him. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, which we invoke, we began in the name of the Trinity. Over the gifts we will invoke the Spirit, send down your Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the one who was sacrificed himself and was raised, is present among us. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. We celebrate our communion with Jesus so that we can rely on his grace to better imitate him and be of one mind and heart with him each day of the subsequent week. Then, to celebrate the Eucharist is a holy thing. It's a good thing. It's a particular way of our gathering and an important dimension of our gathering. And if it is not as popular as we would like it to be, if we don't draw as many people as in the past, the problem may not necessarily be with what and how we celebrate. The problem could very well be, or the lack of popularity of doing that, could very well be the values of the world. The values of the world are in trouble because they cannot find space. They cannot find time to give thanks to God through Christ Jesus. So we can't beat ourselves up if our Eucharistic celebrations aren't as joyous or as full as we might like In our second reading, when Paul recounted the Last Supper, he was hopping mad. He was furious. He was angry. He writes to the community at Corinth about the way they're celebrating the Last Supper. There was, it would seem, in the church a great inequality. And Paul is aware that they're coming together is not actually a coming together at all. The more privileged and the wealthier among them eat their meal heartily. Some, it was implied, even get drunk. 
and the poorer members get less and may even go hungry. It is precisely to confront that that in the middle of his criticism, Paul tells us about what unfolded on the night of the Last Supper. The community is to be shocked into realizing that as Jesus gave himself for those he was gathered with, equally, those of us who gather must give ourselves to one another in a similar act of service. In other words, our coming together is not only a holy thing that puts us in communion with God, but it is a communion that brings us closer to each other and makes us church and challenges us about the quality of our reaction, that we too must hand ourselves over. So I invite us today on this great feast to appreciate the gathering we have available to us each Sunday in celebrating the Eucharist. Nothing is preventing us getting together at other times. Amen, let's do it. But not to celebrate the Mass each week would impoverish us because it would distance us unnecessarily from Jesus. Celebrating the Mass each Sunday puts us in communion with the central mystery of Jesus, the Son of God. The Mass confronts us as a community about the standard with which we must interact with each other and serve each other. And so I pray that we may have a deep appreciation, an ongoing love and appreciation for the mysteries we celebrate in the Eucharist.